and it's tricky too because the the term exceptional circumstances isn't defined. Yeah, what does it mean? What makes something exceptional? <laughs> Very hard to tell. Is it the person being investigated that has to be exceptional or do you need like some exceptional corruption to, mm. you know, to to meet that threshold? It really puts I think the commissioner in a, a difficult position. The less clear that that threshold is, the more opportunity there is to delay public hearings by taking it all the way through the courts. And that's a real concern too. And one for mum, one for dad, and one for the country. And there has never been a more exciting time to be an Australian. Budgets are about choices, Fran, and you show what you value through the choices you make. Dead, buried, cremated. This is cold. Don't be afraid. The Don't be scared. Treasurer, the Treasurer you. knows. Australia is basically done for. We'll just end up being a third-rate economy. You know, a banana republic. How good is Australia? Just follow the money. G'day, and welcome to Follow the Money, the Australia Institute's podcast that explains big economic issues in plain English. I'm Ebony Bennett, Deputy Director at the Australia Institute, and today we're going to give you a quick wrap-up of the legislation to establish a National Anti-Corruption Commission to investigate serious and systemic corruption, which the Attorney-General introduced into the Parliament yesterday. Well, all the talk today, aside from the budget, of course, is the National Anti-Corruption Commission. The federal government unveiled the details of its The proposed... Albanese government finally delivered the detail of its model for a broad-based anti-corruption... To establish a powerful, transparent and independent National Anti-Corruption Commission. Today is an incredibly important day. All of these people standing behind me are here because they believe in a strong, robust Federal Integrity Commission a watchdog with teeth. We are working sensibly and constructively with the government to implement an integrity commission. There are still concerns amongst the crossbench and top lawyers around the issue of public hearings. The crossbench is pushing for what they say is the uh, the, the version that gets the most sunlight in, if you like. Public trust in politicians out there, and if you want to play this out, it's going to have to be in the public arena. The National Anti-Corruption Commission has been a long time coming. To see the legislation tabled in the Parliament on Wednesday, within six months of the Labor government taking office, is a huge step towards restoring Australians' trust and faith in democracy, which has been pretty much at an all-time low. It is clear that this bill fills a big gap in Australia's federal integrity systems. But, as always, the devil is in the detail. So, to understand how the National Anti-Corruption Commission will work, I'm joined by Bill Brown, Director of the Australia Institute's Democracy and Accountability Program. G'day, Bill. Thanks for having me. Bill, uh, let's start with the basics. What are the key provisions of the National Anti-Corruption Commission as tabled in the Parliament? We have a guide to what a strong integrity commission looks like, which has been laid out by the National Integrity Committee of former judges, supported by the Australia Institute. And they've identified eight principles that are really needed if you're going to have a commission that can root out corruption at the highest level. Firstly, the commission needs to be independent and it needs to have the resources that allow it to do its job. We found a a real danger with integrity bodies that might have inadequate funding or vulnerable funding, um, that there's a perception that the government of the day can pressure them by withdrawing funding or or making it conditional. So having that well-funded integrity commission is really important. Uh, And the bill does that. It provides for an independent commissioner, very difficult to remove from their position once they're appointed. Yep. Uh, And there's a large amount of funding set aside. I can today announce that the government has committed $262 million over four years for the establishment and ongoing operation of the Commission. This is close to $90 million more than the former government committed. This funding will ensure that the Commission has the staff, capabilities and capacity to properly consider referrals and allegations conduct timely investigations and undertake corruption prevention and education activities. So that funding, uh, how does that compare to other state corruption bodies, for example? So the funding the Albanese government's announced, $262 million over four years, 
uh, would put the NAC, the national body, uh, at about equal highest funding um, level with Queensland's. Some people have flagged that that might be a bit low. Um, another figure given has been $100 million per year, um, but it's a fair bit larger than what the coalition was proposing for their body. Bides for a parliamentary joint committee for the National Anti-Corruption Commission to regularly review and publicly report on the sufficiency of the Commission's budget. Those reports would be subject to public debate, a debate which would likely be uncomfortable for any government that chose to ignore them. I guess we'll all have to get used to calling it the NAC instead of an ICAC now, which is <laughs> how it's been discussed uh, in previous years. So that's um, the independence of the funding. What are some of the other key principles we're looking for here? You also want your anti-corruption body to have a broad jurisdiction, to be able to root out corruption where it appears. Uh, and that's been provided for in the definition of corrupt conduct uh, that the draft bill has. It allows for investigating not just public officials, and that includes politicians and their staff, uh, but also those who interact with public officials and might attempt to influence them or try to corrupt those public officials. As you can imagine, it would greatly limit the body if it was only able to look at the public officials and not at the people who might be corrupting them. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so that's um, two broad ticks at the moment. Uh, another key question has been the ability of this commission to... Uh, initiate its own investigations and things like being able to accept complaints from whistleblowers. How does it fare on that front, Bill? One of the concerns with the Morrison government's proposed bill, uh, which never made it to Parliament in the end, was that the body they were proposing was severely limited in what kinds of complaints it could receive and from whom. Um, that's very different in the NAC, Labor's model, uh, that we've seen tabled. Uh, in the NAC, they can investigate on their own motion. So the NAC can look into issues that they're concerned about, even if they don't receive a referral. And they can also receive complaints and tip-offs and allegations from members of the public and whistleblowers and so on. Um, there are big problems with Australia's whistleblower protections in general. There are some protections in this bill for those particularly involved in the commission, uh, but there's also moves afoot from the Attorney General to amend those general laws as well. Yeah, he kind of flagged that that might be addressed in some separate and specific legislation to deal with some of those issues with whistleblowers. The whistleblower protections in this bill are, are not strong. Um, they are as weak as the existing weak defective whistleblowing laws that we know that the Commonwealth already suffers from. Uh, the next thing I was going to ask you about is um, this idea of retrospectivity. So can you explain to me why people care about that, why that is important, and what kind of provisions about that are contained within this draft bill? Yeah, so the general concern with retrospectivity is that people should know the rules at the time. So you don't want to in almost any circumstance, introduce a criminal offence that would put someone in jail for doing something that wasn't a crime when they did it. Yeah. But the retrospectivity that we're talking about for the commission is a bit different. The commission's intended as a fact-finding body, and that means it's not going to be making those findings of criminal conduct itself. It's going to be looking at whether, as a matter of fact, there was corruption. Uh, and in that way, it's analogous with something like a royal commission. When we set up the royal commission into banking, for example, we didn't wait for the banks to commit more wrongdoing <laughs> after the commission. We let them look retrospectively and draw conclusions about that. Similarly, uh, with the NAC, there's not going to be someone who didn't realise what they were doing was corrupt at the time who might now be investigated. They knew it was corrupt at the time and now they can be investigated. So I think that's very different. Yeah, it's a it's a very different prospect. It's essentially the wrongdoing has been wrongdoing all along. There's just now a body to investigate it. It's not redefining what we consider corrupt conduct, for example, and now making that a crime. 
That's right. So just thinking about that uh, and speaking of royal commissions, uh, this is going to be a powerful corruption body. That's important because by its nature, corruption is hidden and secretive and often performed by people who kind of know how to hide it in the system. Um, What are some of the powers that it's going to have? The commission's going to have broad powers to call witnesses and compel people to give evidence, as well as investigative powers, like being able to conduct wiretaps and searches and so on. So would it be roughly similar to like a royal commission? Roughly analogous, yeah. I haven't gone power by power and confirmed they're exactly the same, but they're built on similar principles with similar powers. Mm. And as you've said, it's it's a, a fact-finding body. So what does that mean when it, when it comes to investigations? What is that going to look like at the end when they deliver a report? We know from the state and territory commissions some of the details of how reporting would look like. You get a mix of reports that don't come out of investigations that are just general um, research works, uh, highlighting broad problems. Uh, And then you've got the specific reports that come out of investigations. Not all of those are public, um, but many of them are. And they'll include findings about wrongdoing that's occurred in particular, um, that the commission has identified as well as, in some cases, recommendations for how this can be addressed more broadly. So broadly speaking, it'll be able to make findings of fact when it comes to corruption. And what happens if they come across criminal behaviour, Bill? Uh, Then they can refer it to the Australian Federal Police and the Director of Public Prosecutions. Uh, So the Commission's not going to be saying itself this was criminal conduct, Um, but they can pass on what they find. And to be clear, it can't send anyone to jail or anything like that for criminal things. That would be still left up to the courts. That's right. That the body would only hold public hearings in as yet undefined exceptional circumstances. Putting exceptional circumstances in as well uh, is a potential break on the process. I think the phrase exceptional circumstances needs work. Margaret White, she's a former Queensland Supreme Court judge and with other retired judges, sits on the Australia Institute's National Integrity Committee. She's pleased with the bill overall, but is also disappointed with the tests for the holding of hearings in public. From the point of view of trying to work out what constitutes exceptional circumstances, the examples given just are not helpful. So, Bill, I'm going to come now to uh, the ability to hold public hearings. That's one of the key things the National Integrity Committee has said that an effective watchdog needs. And it's also emerging as essentially, I guess, one of the most critiqued and contentious elements of this legislation. Why is that? The ability to hold public hearings is a vital power of an integrity commission um, because part of the point of these commissions is to shine a light on wrongdoing. There's concern that public hearings can damage the reputations of those involved. Uh, And in some cases, those who aren't under suspicion um, but nonetheless find themselves in quite a public position at a hearing So it's emerged for a long time as a a bone of contention with those who either don't want an integrity commission or want one with much more limited powers. If you get an ICAC wrong, it will actually deter good people from entering public life. Um, I don't want innocent people being trashed and I don't want their reputations being trashed and I don't want uh, people committing suicide as we've seen in South Australia and elsewhere. Uh, as a result of false allegations having been levelled against them. Position to the Attorney-General that checks and balances must be in place to preclude witch hunts. The compromise that exists in the NAC bill as it currently stands is that there are provisions for public hearings. It's for the Commissioner to decide whether to hold them. And that's important to note. It's never in any commission a requirement to hold a public hearing. Uh, It's occurs when needed. It's at the discretion of the commission. That's right. And uh, in the case of the federal legislation, it would be when the hearing is in the public interest, that it be public, uh, and 
only in exceptional circumstances. And it's that second part of that requirement that's proved a particular sticking point among integrity groups and the National Integrity Committee of former judges. That wording is similar to what appears in Victoria. And you can see just from a comparison of Victorian inquiries to New South Wales inquiries that New South Wales, without that provision, holds many more public hearings than its Victorian counterpart does. So it is a barrier, essentially. That's right. It's a barrier. And it's tricky, too, because the the term exceptional circumstances isn't defined. Yeah. What does it mean? What makes something exceptional? (laughs) Very hard to tell. Yeah. Yeah. Is it, is it the person being investigated that has to be exceptional or do you need like some exceptional corruption to, mm. you know, to, to meet that threshold? Yes, the seriousness of it or, or the uniqueness of the type, it really puts, I think, the commissioner in a, a difficult position. Um, and the other problem is that the less clear that that threshold is, the more opportunity there is to delay public hearings by taking it all the way through the courts. And that's a real concern too. And it's a very different threshold to me than just being in the public interest, in the public interest and in exceptional circumstances. Like if something is already judged to be in the public interest, why, why do you need that additional test, I guess? Yes, I would have thought the public interest should should trump other concerns and, mm. and we should hold a public hearing anytime it's in the public interest. And to be clear... Having read this particular part of the legislation, there is some indications in the legislation of the types of things that the Commission should take into account before holding a public hearing, including things like the potential to damage someone's reputation as well as the public interest. So there is some sense in there of the types of considerations that should be made already, but no further clarity on exceptional circumstances and what that might mean. That's right. And I think it's worth noting the government has already thought hard about these issues and it has the state and territory commissions to to look at and see potential pitfalls, um, which is one reason why this exceptional circumstances part sticks out like a proud nail. Yeah, I was listening to the Attorney General on, uh, I think it was Radio National Breakfast this morning, and he was kind of referring to well, the New South Wales ICAC has the ability to hold public hearings but only does so in about 5% of cases. Looking at the experience of the New South Wales ICAC, that only about, well, its experience is that only 5% of its hearings are in public. That already tells you that it's a fairly exceptional thing for an anti-corruption commission like this to hold a public hearing. Uh, which I think is, you know, I've got no reason to doubt his statistics there, but as far as I know, it does not have an exceptional circumstances test. Is that right? That's right. Uh, And yet, even so, it uses these hearings very sparingly. Mm. So ultimately, when it is up to the discretion of these commissions, they use that discretion. That's right. Uh, And you can imagine why. I mean, there's an example from ICAC in one of the cases where it did hold public hearings and they had to call well over 100 witnesses. So they're not going to be rushing into this willy nilly. They're going to weigh up the importance of exposing corruption and making sure that justice is seen to be done and not just done, um, as well as the educative role that having these claims problems brought to light can play. Exceptional circumstances provision has caused trouble um, in Victoria. It has reduced dramatically the number of um, public hearings that have been held compared with New South Wales. And there are benefits in in these cases to have public hearings. It allows other people who otherwise wouldn't know that the investigation is ongoing, who may have information, to come forward. And if done in the right way, can start to rebuild trust in politics at a time where we so, desperately need So would that. you vote for it? Yeah. yeah, just to stick with the importance of public hearings, like it's not, we're not talking about having them for their own sake. As you said, they play an important edu- educative role. I'm assuming they also play some kind of a, a role in deterrence as well. Um, but correct me if I'm wrong, corruption experts also talk about the fact that it can help things like witnesses to come forward. Is that right? Absolutely. Um, And there's an example from Victoria. Although they hold these hearings more rarely, they have had some. And uh, one of them was about 
alleged corruption in the education department. And after they held public hearings where they explored the misuse of public money on alcohol and hospitality and expensive retreats and so on, there was a big influx of other reports about other wrongdoing in the education department. It's hard to imagine that coming to light if the hearings were private, even if the report is public months or years later, but without that that kind of hearing mm. that people could actually witness for themselves. Mm. Bill, um, so overall, it sounds like it is a very big step forward for improving integrity, but are there any other concerns about the bill that you expect to be picked up now that it's kind of headed to an inquiry? There are a few concerns that have been flagged. Um, one we've mentioned briefly is the amount of funding, which is higher than the previous model, but lower than the figure that some people have said. There's also been concerns raised about um, fraud on a public official who is themselves blameless, not necessarily being covered. And a final concern is the makeup of the committee, which will have oversight along with an inspector who's separate, um, but oversight over the commission and also the power to approve the appointment of the commissioner with the decision itself being made by the minister. Um, the committee is very finely balanced. It's got half government members and half members made up from the opposition and the crossbench. But because the chair has a casting vote as well as a deliberative vote, it does give the government the numbers on the committee. Um, and I imagine we'll see explored whether the committee should be um, bipartisan or tripartisan to the extent even that a vote should not be carried just on government numbers. Mm, that's an interesting one to consider because if you're talking about independence and I guess buy-in from the parliament, you can see how that would be really important and the government just always having the numbers. Um, might sound good to the Labor government now, but I wonder if it would sound as good if they were in opposition facing that prospect. Bill, what do the numbers look like? This has been introduced to the parliament. It's now set to go off for an inquiry. What have been the responses from the opposition, the Greens and the crossbench so far? Yeah, well, it should be noted that an integrity commission is the policy of, I think, every party in parliament. <laughs> We've come a long way since we first started uh, advocating for the need for one of these, Bill. That's right, when neither major party <laughs> supported it. I'd like to acknowledge the constructive engagement on this bill from my cabinet and caucus colleagues. The opposition, crossbenchers in this house and the other place, and also acknowledge the efforts of those in this house who kept up pressure in the last parliament particularly the member for Indo. Um, but it's the strength of that commission that's really the, the point of contention between the different parties. Um, opposition leader Peter Dutton has flagged his intention to support the commission, obviously subject to negotiations, uh, and we'll see kind of they've long been uh, more critical of public hearings and more supportive of limitations on public hearings. The crossbench and the Greens, conversely, have said that the public hearing provision is too limited, that that exceptional circumstances threshold should be removed. And now the, the Labor Party, having approved the bill in caucus, has the numbers in the House of Representatives, but will have to decide, I think, whether it negotiates with the crossbench and the Greens in the Senate or with the coalition or if it can thread that needle and, and somehow get both on board. And get consensus. Wouldn't that be quite something? That would be. <laughs> a National Integrity Commission has been a long time coming, and it's something that we've seen public support for since we first started polling on the issue back in 2016. Uh, and in the interim, it's been supported by a great host of experts, including former judges like those on the National Integrity Committee, and that's been backed up by the work of crossbenchers and then Shadow Attorney General Mark Dreyfus, who've joined the call for a strong integrity commission uh, and the work um, that's been done in drafting bills like Helen Haynes' bill, some of the DNA of which we see in this model as well. Uh, so there's been a real collaboration across the board to get something here. And I think it's really momentous that it's happened. Yeah, and I guess it goes back again to the 
federal election result where integrity was one of the the, the really key issues of that election and I guess of, of who's ended up in this parliament. Absolutely. And we really have a super majority for a strong integrity commission. So we'll see what comes of that. Fingers crossed. We'll keep you posted uh, as the inquiry proceeds and as the bill gets closer to uh, passing through both houses of parliament. Uh, we'll wrap it up there. Thanks very much, Bill. Thank you, Ebony. This episode was recorded on Thursday, the 29th of September 2022, and things may have changed since recording. You can visit australiainstitute.org.au for all our latest research and content, including the National Integrity Committee's blueprint for how to design an effective corruption watchdog, as well as all the polling that we've done over the years proving that an effective corruption watchdog with teeth is absolutely what the overwhelming majority of Australians support. My Twitter handle is ebony underscore Bennett with a double N double T. You can find the Australia Institute at the Oz Institute with an AUS. Bill Brown is at Brown90, that's Brown with an E. And our producer Jennifer Macy is at Jennifer Macy. Our theme music is by Jonathan McFeet from Pulse and Thrum with additional music from Blue Dot Sessions. Thanks for listening. Listener.